you haven't figured out already, it's not the somber silence of Good Friday today. <laughs> but on Friday, we had a tremendous time in silence. It was Friday. Jesus had been betrayed. The disciples scattered. Hope seemed lost. All hope for humanity, for all of creation, was nailed to the cross with Jesus. He could have saved himself. He could have allowed us, you and I, to pay the consequences for our sin, to get what we actually deserve, but he did not. We listened to the anguish and the truth of a crucifixion. We heard the heart of Anne as she shared her thoughts and the thoughts of many of us as we contemplated the death of Jesus on Friday and the reason that he died on the cross for us. Here's some of her words. Still, I confess, I struggle with the crucifixion, with the horror and the violence and the humiliation, and why it was all necessary. I think this reveals how little I truly grasp the true nature of sin. Sin stands in complete opposition to God, and therefore in complete opposition to life, to truth, and to love. Which in contrast means sin only leads to death, to annihilation, to division, but also to a complete rendering of all unity between us and God, between us and each other, and even us with ourselves. Sin produces utter hopelessness, because at the root of sin is deceit, deception, and a lie. Sin is violent. Sin is brutal. It is full of horror and terror because its purpose, its sole purpose is death. Yet sin so often seems harmless, so insignificant, so unworthy the effort, the hassle to resist it as is often required. Pilate repeatedly gave the crowd the opportunity to release Jesus, but each time Pilate did this, the crowd's response grew more determined until they all cried, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. This is why we gathered on Good Friday in somber silence, because each of us must confront the depths of darkness even within us, the hold that sin has over us if we are ever to come to terms with the need that we have, the reality that we need Jesus, we have to understand the horribleness of sin. We need to really know the need for a Savior, our need for a Good Friday. For without it, there is no Resurrection Sunday for us. That was Friday. As I contemplate that, And what sin does, bringing separation between us and God and us and others, and even between God and ourselves, perhaps you work in a place and you have a policy to deal with disagreements. Do you have that at your workplace? (laughs) Just in case (laughs) there might, in the off chance, be a disagreement where you work. Conflict resolution policy, it's called. You know what? I need one for myself. (laughs) I'm in conflict with myself many times. I have disagreements with myself. This is what sin does. And Jesus comes in and it says on the cross, he took all of our sins and the peace that we now need with God because of our separation from him is dealt with on the cross. That's one side of the coin the death of Jesus. The other side is today, the resurrection. We have death on one side and resurrection on the other, and you cannot separate the importance of each. That's why we can't just talk about resurrection today. We need to go back and understand why it really matters because of the death of Jesus. 
We cannot have one without the other. In John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And he asks us this question as he did the disciples. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? So the Resurrection Sunday is for us today. It's a question we need to answer. Do we believe this? Because your future, your destiny, your existence after death depends on your answer. So let's look at the first words of Jesus recorded in the the Gospel of Mark. He said this, it's recorded, the time has come. All that's been said in the Old Testament over 2,000 years, all these prophecies of the kingdom coming and a Messiah coming, the king of the Jews coming, he said, the time has arrived. In the fullness of time, Paul says, Jesus arrived on the scene in his timing. The time has come. The kingdom of God is here. It's come near. And this is the first word here, repent. Repent. Turn from your sin. Turn to God. Don't just repent, though, and believe the good news. And that's what the resurrection is. It's about the good news. We're going to get into that. Repent is a Hebrew word meaning to turn. As we heard, sin is serious. Jesus came to bring us out of our slavery to it. We are to turn away from it, to flee from it. How? Because of the resurrection. Jesus forgave people of their sins. He said, repent. He said, go and sin no more. That's what repentance means. Repent, walk the other way, get on a new road, turn around. You're in a dead end street, repent. Jesus did not need to repent. He was already on this kingdom road. He is the king of the kingdom road. And Satan tried to get Jesus to turn. To repent, in a way, when he took him out in the desert and was tempting him for 40 days. Jesus turned from God's way to your own way, basically what these three temptations are about. I won't do a whole sermon on them, but here's, in a nutshell, the temptations for Jesus to repent that Satan gave to him, to repent and follow Satan and not God, was about taking power over your own life. Jesus, take some power over your own life. Not God's will. Go after your own will. That's what these temptations are about. Take power over your own life. These temptations were not typical sin temptations that we often talk about. Sexual immorality or lying or hatred or murder. This was about Satan appealing to greed and self-fulfillment. Living with only yourself in mind. He says, Jesus, go live for yourself. Do it. I... And then within this, testing God in the midst. So this was the voice of Satan in the wilderness. If you are the son of God, do all the stuff you want to make life work for you. Go after power. Take all the kingdoms on. The religious leader said to Jesus, if you are the son of God. Pilate said to him, if you are the son of God. The soldier said to him, if you are the king of the Jews. Even the thief on the cross If you are the Son of God, save us. Save yourself and us. If you are the Son of God. If you are who you say you are. Surely you would want everyone to see your supernatural power. Get off the cross. Save yourself. What are you doing on the cross? You know, the voice of Satan, the lies of the enemy... As Anne shared there, the deception of sin almost sounds sometimes common sense. The voice of Satan sometimes seems like a voice of common sense and reason. When Jesus was telling his disciples what the plan was, that he must go to Jerusalem because he's going to die, Peter said, no, that's not going to happen. Remember, this is the response of Jesus to, to, to Peter. Get behind me. Not Peter. Get behind me, Satan. That was the deception. 
Jesus, come on, go after your own life, your own self-fulfillment. Go after your own dreams. Think about yourself only. That's the temptation here. If you are the Son of God, certainly this can't be the way things end. The Jews were waiting for God to step into history, lead them into triumph against the Roman invasion and taxation and occupation. They wanted to taste freedom. And they thought Jesus was going to give it to them, but there he was on the cross. And as we know now, the rest of the story, a few years later, why he was on the cross. It's a different kind of slavery. It's a slavery to sin he delivers us from. They thought the Messiah would be like David, fighting the new Goliath. He would be a warrior king, but there he was on the cross. And that's the background to the mockery that you read in the gospel accounts. If you are, you certainly should not be hanging on a cross. What happened to these words of eternal life? They don't seem to be happening. You're hanging on a cross. What happened to the words of abundant and meaningful life to the full doesn't seem to be happening, you're hanging on a cross. What happened to the words of rest and peace and hope? They were hanging on a cross. For the crowds, the cross is a failed Messiah. Jesus could have summoned hundreds of angels to protect him as he was in the garden. That's what Peter tried to do. He cut off the one soldier's ear and was going to fight back. And he said, no, this is not what this is about. I'm going to the cross. In the garden, Jesus asked for the cup representing death to pass by him. God, is there, Father, is there any other way? Can there be another way to deal with the sin problem of this world? And the answer is no. So Jesus said, thy will be done to deal with the sin problem. Not my will. His will will be done. He was on the cross through sheer obedience. How do you and I live the rest of our lives understanding what it means that you're a sinner? Sin is serious. So on Friday, we took communion. And I asked just a couple things of people to come forward and receive communion. Believe you're a sinner. Believe sin is serious. And know that that represents, represents all that Jesus did. We'll move into that a bit more. And at the end of this service, I'm going to ask you to come forward and grab. We have 800 daffodils here. So I think there's enough for all of you to take a handful. (laughs) And it's going to represent the resurrection. That you can come up and grab one and say, Jesus, I'm moving forward. I'm getting on the right road. I'm going to be on the resurrection road that we're going to talk about here in a minute. So Jesus went to the cross because he was the Son of God. He was the only one qualified to take on the sins of the world. It is because I am the Son of God, he's telling his disciples, and you and I, that I can go to the cross. This is my calling. This is what I came onto earth for. What do you mean, if you are the Son of God? He could have said back, but he was like a sheep who was silent before his shears. He did not talk back. But if I was Jesus, I would have talked back, and I might have said this. What do you mean, if you are the Son of God? I am the Son of God. He didn't say that. He let his actions speak. I am the Son of God. I am the one who can take away the sin of the world. So he died on the cross. On the ninth hour, he said, it is finished. At that moment, the curtain in the temple tore in two from top to bottom. This curtain separated the holy place from the most holy place. It was, this curtain was six stories high. It was 30 feet wide. And only the high priest passed through it once a year on the Day of Atonement into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God. And when Jesus died, that curtain was torn from top to bottom. Do you see the significance of that? That you and I walk into the Holy of Holies every day. We don't need the blood of bulls and goats. We don't have a day of atonement every year now. We have a day of atonement every single second of your life. We have atonement all the time. He said, testelestai, that was the word. It's finished. 
I finished exactly what I set out to do. No regrets. The last words spoken in the last minute of his last hour on the earth, he says, it is finished. Then he breathed his last and he was dead. All was completed. Scriptures were fulfilled. Over 300 prophecies fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This, I, this Greek word to telestai has a meaning of to bring to an end, to complete, to accomplish. It's a crucial word because it signifies the successful end to a particular course of action. You and I are sinners, sin is serious, we have to have our sins forgiven, and it's finished. It's done. He did it all. It's a word you might say when you finish your first 10K. If you're going to compete this, I know uh, Fraser is competing in a 300-mile <clears throat> race this summer. And when he gets to the end of it, I hope he yells to tell us, I. And people wonder, what does that mean? And he'll give him a little sermon on the gospel here. <laughs> it's finished. But let me tell you about someone who finished better than me, and that's Jesus. There you go, Fraser. <laughs> finished, I'm done. When you finish your... 100, if they make such a thing, I'll say 10,000 piece puzzle. What do you do? Tetelestai. It's finished. Not just I survived, but I accomplished exactly what I set out to do. And this is the work on the cross. And what did Jesus set out to do was to give you and I forgiveness, to break the enmity between us and God. Forgiveness. Do you need it? Do we understand forgiveness? I'm going to give a couple of sports illustrations. <laughs> and a couple other ones. But, you know, when you go to buy golf clubs, there's a couple of choices. You can buy what are called players forged clubs. Or you can buy clubs that say, and this is how they advertise it, this club offers forgiveness. <laughs> how does that work? It does. We'll get into it in a minute. Golf clubs that offer forgiveness. So I looked this up. I Googled, did a bit of Googling around. Did you know who here designs highways? I know we have a friend here who designs our roundabouts in the city. And they need to design them with a sense of forgiveness. I'll get to what that means. The concept of forgiving design was developed by transportation engineers to lessen or avoid the impact of run-off-the-road crashes. The general premise is that highways should have broad shoulders with gentle slopes and a roadside clear zone which is free of fixed objects such as light poles. Does that make sense? Drive down Chilliwack, River Road right now by Chach and Band, it's very narrow. Drive down Prest Road, even parts of it today, there's telephone poles, you know, like six inches off the side of the road. No forgiveness. You gotta be perfect. You gotta slow down. You can't be crazy. Or there's a crash. So, so when you drive down Chilliwack River Road, just think of forgiveness that, you know, one day this road is gonna be wider. There'll be forgiveness. You don't have to be perfect. Student loans. <laughs> Looking at the student section over here. Sometimes the government, what do they do? They forgive your loan. It's finished, paid in full, I'm doing it. Mortgage forgiveness, loan forgiveness. So here, here's my second one. Let's go play tennis, okay, you and I. Let's see who I want to play here. Where's Doris? <laughs> Where is she? Put your hand up, Doris. Come on. She's out with her grandson. Okay, should I play her husband? Okay, we're going to play some tennis. Pick your racket. So... <laughs> See what I got here? <laughs> Oli picked this one. 
Oli, why did you pick that one? Forgiveness. It's got forgiveness. <laughs> That's right. But my guess is Doris could use this one, and I use this one. She would beat me because it really depends on the player as well. But this is forgiveness. It's called a sweet spot. That if you want to hit this perfectly on these smaller rockets, this is maybe a Bjorn Borg from the 70s, you got to, this is your area. You got to be pretty perfect. But then they come up with these rockets, and the reason you could go bigger is they can, don't have to make them out of wood anymore. They're graphite and other fancy metals. Look at the size of that sweet spot. You don't have to be as perfect. There's forgiveness. In the tennis racket, there's forgiveness in a golf club. There's forgiveness on the highways we drive. And there needs to be forgiveness in your soul as you live out your life. You, you can live in that. That's what the cross is about. We need to live in forgiveness. We need to be on the freeway of forgiveness, the road of forgiveness, whatever word you want to use. That's what the cross does for us. We live in forgiveness, and you need it, and I need it. All have sinned and fall really short of the standard of God, of the glory of God, is the way Paul puts it. We need to forgive others. We need to forgive ourselves. We need to ask God for forgiveness. When, when David did his deeds of adultery and murder, he confessed his sin because he understood he, conf- he sinned against God, not just other humans. We need to live in this forgiveness. We need to forgive others as he forgives us. We need to allow others to live in forgiveness around us. We need to live this way. Jesus said, I'm the way of forgiveness. I am the truth of forgiveness. I am the life of forgiveness. His road, (laughs) if I can use the idea of building forgiveness into a road system, his road has forgiveness designed and implemented in its very, very essence. Are you living in the forgiveness of God this morning? Is this the road you're on? If not, get on it. Your eternal destiny depends on it. This is what the cross is. Maybe you're on a nervous road. You're on an anxious road. You're nervous and anxious, but what happens after death? What happens after you die? Jesus said, repent, believe in me. This is good news. Get off that nervous road, that road where you wonder what happens when I die. Jesus said, this is what happens to you. You repent and you believe in me, and though you die, you will be alive. Actually, more than ever. More than we experience on earth. Jesus says, turn around, repent, believe the good news, get on this forgiveness road. That's the first basic truth about the Easter story. The second one, obviously, is the resurrection. So we go to the empty tomb. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ is not raised from the dead, our faith is futile and useless. So this isn't just a nice philosophy for believers to have to get us through sad times. They all just believe in the resurrection. No, if it's not true, it's futile, it's useless, and we're liars, Paul said. Paul said this resurrection is real. He saw Jesus. Jesus appeared to more than 500 people after his resurrection. And Paul said, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of resurrection. So after the service, you want to confess to God, I want to know the power of reservation. Come grab some daffodils. Representation of new life and resurrection. And this resurrected life is for us now. It's not just when we die. It's something that can happen now. It can make a difference in our life now. When I die, I do not really die ultimately, as I will be resurrected from the dead, just like Jesus promised, but now there can be something going on in my soul, in your soul. So we can live out the resurrection. What might, what might it look like? And again, when we think of living in the power of Jesus, with all oh, the miraculous, and raising the dead and healing the sick, these things I'm going to list are things that Jesus talked about, and they're miraculous too to get people who are saturated with living for themselves. You know, when you love your enemy, 
That's a resurrected life. When you let go of a grudge, that's living on the freeway of forgiveness and it's resurrection life. When you keep the gossip in your mind and not out there, keep it off your tongue, that's resurrection life. When you stop fighting to have things always go your way, that's the miracle of resurrection in your heart, in your soul. When you think of your interest ahead of others, that's what it means to live on this highway, this freeway, this road of forgiveness and resurrection. When you have two coats and give one away, when you're tempted and you find the way out that God has provided, when you're quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, that's what it's like to live on this free way of forgiveness and this resurrection. When we choose encouragement into someone's life to build them up and not to bring slander and insult to them, that's what it means to live in forgiveness, in the sweet spot of forgiveness. When we get rid of all rage and bitterness and anger and slander, that's what it means for you and I, and as a church, to live in forgiveness. When we're kind and compassionate, forgiving, just as Christ forgave us, that's the power of the resurrection today. So forgiveness and resurrection life. Jesus went to the cross. He said it's finished. The work is done, paid in full. There's resurrection power now. And so he invites you, invites me to come. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. Maybe, maybe I can add anxious and nervous and panicked about life and eternal life and what happens when you die. Come to me, all who are like this, and I'll give you rest for your souls. I am gentle, Jesus said. I am humble in my heart. And you can find rest for your souls in me. That's what the Easter story is. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So there's the invitation, he says. Come to me. Another invitation we read in the book of Revelation. It's a letter to a church that wasn't doing very well. It says they had lost their first love. They had a bit of sin in the camp. And he said, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear me calling, I will come in and we will share a meal as friends. That's what he said. Come. Come. He stands at the door of your heart. He says, let me in. Come in. I can put you on this forgiveness road that you need so dearly. Look, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Believe the good news. Receive him couple of illustrations to help us understand this. You've been given a gift card to go to Original Joe's. If two people want to eat at any restaurant today, a gift card probably needs to be about 200 bucks. And just a hamburger is $22. Unbelievable. But this week, the NW coupons came in the mail, so. <laughs> been a big bonus week for, for the Simpsons. But you get a gift card. You go order your meal. Do you pay for it as well? Oh, maybe if you went over. I don't understand. But if the gift card is for 100 bucks and the bill's 80, you should tip the 20, just letting you know, okay? Tip, tip it, tip it. You don't say, but I also want to pay for the meal. No, that's, what, that's why it's called a gift card. And Jesus describes, Paul describes, it's a free gift of eternal life. We don't pay it back. How many of you been on an inclusive holiday or a cruise? Inclusive means all the food, and for those heavy drinkers, they love it, lots of booze. If you go on one of these, you don't go and pay for it. It's included. So when Jesus said, paid in full to tell us that, you don't bring anything to the equation. Getting forgiveness is not Dutch treat. You pay a bit, Jesus pays a bit. He pays it all. Your debt's been paid. We're broke. We're sinners. Sin is serious. We cannot pay. So that's the invitation. Just come to me. Weak, burdened, heavy loaded, anxious, nervous. So we listen to his extravagant claims because of this.
Blessed are you when people insult you. Do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's an invitation of Jesus to live a little differently than the culture. These are the words of Jesus. He knows you. He sees you. He wants to come into your life. Speak this gospel. Live this gospel. And all this hard work will not be in vain. I want to invite the worship band to come on up to sing. So you've heard a couple things today, and maybe the Holy Spirit has tugged your heart and taught you a few more things than what was just said here. Number one, are you on the forgiveness freeway? Are you living in that? You need to. You must. And the resurrection life now, the power we can have to do the things that Jesus said. In Hebrews 10, 34, it says that that next life, there's better and lasting possessions. You won't have to clean the gutters in heaven. You won't have to wash your car. Better and lasting possessions on earth. So don't live for the possessions here on earth, he says. This is the resurrection life. It's beautiful as it's described in the scriptures. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. That's the future resurrection life. Go get it. Make sure you understand what it means to have invited Christ into your life. Come to the front at the end of the service. Grab some daffodils. Talk to me. Talk to some others. People that maybe brought you and say, this is forgiveness in Jesus.